In today's video, we'll be looking at the various causes of itchy scalp, what it can mean to the health of your hair, and exactly how you can treat it. Stay tuned. Hey guys, Leon here from HairGod.com, where people who are worried about their hair loss go to regrow their hair. Guys, if you're personally worried about your own hair loss, then do make sure to click the link in the description to take the Hair God Hair Loss Quiz. All you've got to do is answer a few short and simple questions about yourself and your hair loss. Then you'll receive free, personalized, expert information on how to regrow healthy hair. So guys, the scientific name of itching is pruritus. This was simply the Latin name for itching. Now, itching is a very common reaction of our body that can be triggered by various causes. Something as small as temporary irritation from shaving, for example, or a minor allergic reaction, or the presence of a foreign body on the skin. Most of the time, the itchiness goes away by itself. But if you have long-term, persistent itchiness, it's your body's way of telling you that there is a problem, and you need to do something about it. The same with the scalp. It's normal to feel itchy from time to time, for example, when you haven't shampooed in a few days. But if the itching is chronic and recurrent, it's probably a signal of an underlying condition. Now, there are three major causes of itchy scalp in adults. We'll go over them separately and examine their possible links to hair loss. We'll also review the standard medical treatments for each and give you some tips for treating them naturally. Guys, at number one, we've got dandruff. Dandruff is the big one. It affects nearly one in two adults, and some research suggests that it might be more common in men. So what exactly is dandruff? Well, the outermost layer of our skin is made up of cells called corneocytes. Like most cells in our body, these are constantly dying and being replaced by new ones. But in dandruff, this normal shedding process is disrupted. The corneocytes retain a high degree of cohesion even after dying and fall off the scalp in large places. These are the so-called dandruff scales that then stick to our hair and litter our clothes. The cause of dandruff is not yet completely understood. It's probably down to a combination of factors that we may never fully understand. These are thought to be physical and chemical triggers in the environment, and for whatever reason, it often flares up in the winter. But scientists now believe that they have identified the main cause of dandruff, the one that accounts for the majority of cases. Well, it's a tiny fungus called Malassezia. This fungus is part of the normal scalp microflora along with other microorganisms. But in dandruff, Malassezia multiplies out of control, displacing the other microorganisms. And bringing it under control is often the easiest, simplest way to treat dandruff. Now, for the majority of people, dandruff on its own does not directly cause hair loss. But that being said, in certain cases, it can precipitate an acute form of hair loss called telogen effluvium. When this happens, the normal hair growth cycle is disrupted, and a large number of follicles enter the so-called telogen or resting phase, where the hair falls out. Sometimes, dandruff can also exacerbate androgenetic alopecia. This is probably due to the constant need we feel to scratch our scalp and the inflammation that comes with scratching. But there might also be other factors that we don't yet fully understand. For example, a study found that in a two-day hair collection, those with healthy scalps lost 50 to 100 hairs, whereas those with dandruff lost between 100 to 300. Now, the standard treatment for dandruff are medicated shampoos. There's a variety of treatment of these on the market, and they don't generally require a doctor's prescription. They contain various ingredients like coal tar, salicylic acid, and ketoconazole. There is also zinc perithione, which is the active ingredient in perhaps the most famous anti-dandruff shampoo, Head and Shoulders. If you suspect you're suffering from dandruff, the obvious first step is to visit your doctor. They'll be able to examine your scalp and very quickly determine if it is indeed dandruff or one of the other conditions that we'll discuss shortly. And together, you can decide on a shampoo treatment. But aside from using a medicated shampoo, there are other steps that you can take. For starters, you can consider cutting down or even eliminating hair styling products. These will leave oily residues on your scalp and disrupt your natural production of sebum. And if there's one thing that Malassezia thrives on, it's a greasy scalp. You might also want to expose your scalp to the sun, in moderation of course, because too much sun exposure can have the effect of flaring up your dandruff. But the most important thing to do is to try and regulate your scalp's natural production of sebum, which I alluded to earlier. 
a disturbance of the scalp's natural sebum production in susceptible individuals is now thought to be one of the most common pathways to dandruff. Malassezia feeds on the excess secretions of the sebaceous glands. It then metabolizes them into compounds that inflame the scalp and eventually cause the dandruff. Now, it is true that shampooing more often can help alleviate the symptoms of dandruff, but it's important to understand that people who are experiencing dandruff already probably have a problem with excess sebum. The constant shampooing is then required to strip away this excess. Rather than stay trapped in a perpetual cycle of daily shampooing, you could try to slowly train your scalp into secreting less sebum. And the way to do this is by gradually cutting down on your frequency of shampooing. You will soon find out that if you stop shampooing daily, say once every two or three days, your scalp will soon stop getting oily a few hours after your last shower. Stress is also thought to play a potential role in exacerbating or flaring up dandruff, so obviously you want to keep this under control as much as possible. Guys, the second cause of itchy scalp that we're going to be looking at is seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis is a condition very similar to dandruff, but with one crucial exception. Whereas dandruff is confined to the scalp, seborrheic dermatitis can also appear in other parts of the body, particularly those rich in the sebaceous glands like the face and the chest. It can occur at any age, though in adulthood, typically after the age of 30. It is a more serious condition than dandruff, as apart from the flaking, there is also a strong inflammatory component. As with dandruff, malassezia is believed to play a role but there are also certainly other hormonal and physiological factors involved. And stress is believed to play a role, potentially leading to exacerbation of symptoms. The most common treatments for seborrheic dermatitis are similar to those used for dandruff. So medicated shampoos containing salicylic acid, tar, zinc perithione, as well as antifungals like ketoconazole. Topical steroids can also be used. If the topical treatments fail, doctors sometimes prescribe systemic medications. A natural treatment for seborrheic dermatitis is tea tree oil. This is an essential oil made from an Australian tree with strong antifungal and antibacterial actions. It has been suggested as a treatment for various skin conditions, including acne and gingivitis. When used for seborrheic dermatitis, it can help soothe the itchiness and irritation. You can apply some of this oil directly on your scalp after diluting it, or you can add it as an ingredient in your homemade shampoo. The other thing you may want to work on is your diet. Now, there is some published research that shows a poor diet is linked to a higher risk of seborrheic dermatitis, while a high intake of healthy foods like fruit lowers the risk. If you think about it, seborrheic dermatitis is an inflammatory condition, and we now know that what we eat plays a critical role in chronic inflammation. Now, we have done loads of videos on diets that can support a healthy scalp and hair growth, so I won't go into them here again. However, I'll link you to multiple videos in the description for you to check out after this video. Guys, the third cause of itchy scalp that we're going to look at is scalp psoriasis. Psoriasis is a chronic autoimmune condition that can appear on any part of the body, including the scalp. The hallmark symptom is scalpy patches of skin that can be very, very itchy. And the scalp is actually the one area where psoriasis is most likely to appear. Sometimes it's confined behind the hairline, so depending on how long your hair is, you might not actually be visible, but it can also spread past the hairline onto the face. Psoriasis affects around 2% of the population and the cause is unknown. Distinguishing psoriasis from seborrheic dermatitis can sometimes be tricky. And in some cases, even histopathological examinations can't distinguish between the two. Now, in most textbooks, you'll find that psoriasis is not linked to hair loss. But if you actually ask dermatologists, many will tell you that it can sometimes cause hair loss. This can take the form of telogen effluvium, which is where many of the hairs are simultaneously in the telogen resting phase and more likely to fall out. In long-lasting psoriasis, a more severe form of the so-called scarring alopecia can occur, and this is irreversible. So scalp psoriasis is something that you would definitely want to get rid of. But if you're suffering from it, I'm sure that this is something that you are already well aware of. As well as with dandruff and seborrheic dermatitis, there is no hard and fast cure for scalp psoriasis. You have to treat it and manage the symptoms for various lengths of time, and eventually there's a good chance that it will go away. The most common treatment options are cold tar shampoos with concentrations between 2 and 10%, and crude cold tar is actually more effective, but it's not practical to apply to the scalp, so the shampoos are used instead. Zinc perithion shampoos can also be used as well as salicylic acid and cold tar. Corticosteroids can also be used ideally in the form of a cream or lotion. A treatment that has been used increasingly in recent decades is topical vitamin D3 analogues. These are synthetic forms of the vitamin. If topical treatments fail, doctors will often prescribe systemic medications. 
Now, if your hair is short enough that the scalp is visible, a treatment option that you might want to discuss with your doctor is ultraviolet radiation. There are medical UVB lamps that can produce dramatic improvements in up to three quarters of patients. You can have the treatments either at hospital or with a device sold for home use. Now, make sure to click the video on the screen now to learn more about Will's eight steps that he used to regrow his hair and the truth about male pattern baldness.